Hello and welcome to Protecting Guys Oasis Global Summit, where we gather for powerful conversations with diverse and visionary collective, collective of speakers who will guide us to receive from Gaia's wisdom well and to renew ourselves in her healing waters so that we may align toward collective evolution with our planet. My name is Maya Zaharov and I'm your host and producer of Protecting Gaia's Oasis. And I really wanna welcome you all of you to the sacred space and to thank you for being here with us. Today, I'm deeply honored to be here with Cater Brown. Welcome, Cater. Good morning. It's great to be here, Maya. Let me um, read your bio, Cater, and uh, so that our audience knows more about you. So Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council an organization offering nature immersion, ceremonial encampments around the world. He's an internationally known ceremonialist, healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. I have known Cater for a long time as a man of spirit with a remarkable devotion to healing. He tends to his duty with royalty and ferocious commitment. As a man who hears the call of earth and nature, Cater extends his hand to those in quest of change and transformation and is always willing to lead them into and guide them through a deep sense of communion with themselves. Having worked with him in a number of rituals and ceremonies and watched carefully the way he gives of himself to spirit, I have come to respect his priestly devotion to the sacred in nature and in every human. His work deserves respect and reverence. Maladoma Somme. I just want to say from my perspective, I have um, met Cater two years ago when I did another summit called the Tuning to the Voice of Mother Earth. And after that time I was, I wanted to know more about Cater, um, about his work. And I went on a vision quest um, guided by Cater and his wonderful team. And from that um, came more of a, of a need, a want to explore um, divination, cowrie shell divination. And uh, Cater suggested Elder Maladoma. And uh, so this is um, where I've been. Uh, I'm on a journey with a year training of uh, how to do a cowrie shell divination. So I dove into Elder Maladoma's world and um, he just passed away in December. So it was... Uh, it was hard to read his quote about Cater and every word is so true and so beautifully written that, um, so if you want to know more about uh, Cater's world, please go to www.rightsofpassagecouncil.org. He does amazing work. So Cater, your topic today uh, just has a wonderful melody to it. It's earth, bone and water healing connections between soil and soul. Mm, you want to tell us more about that? When you were reading uh, Melodoma's quote, I started to weep. Um, it's just, it brings it, brings it back. It's the first time I've heard it read and uh, or actually talked about him in, in a deeper way since his passing. Um, so I'd like to not only honor his life and medicine and his teachers, um, but all the teachers that uh, have assisted in uh, me in getting here and hopefully coming up with something adequate to share. <laughs> so in doing that, I would like to offer an invocation as a way of beginning, uh, invocation or expression of gratitude and calling the spirits as a way of starting this, starting this conversation and see where it goes. So I'm going to begin rattling in just a moment, um, but I want to invite all of you to, to take a deep breath, close your eyes, and visit some place in nature that knows your name. 
some place you have relationship and that has relationship with you. And see yourself in that place. See yourself maybe standing there welcoming the sunrise. And as you're standing there seeing that sunrise in that special place that knows your name, uh, I'll begin this invocation. So with much gratitude, with open hearts, with clear hearts, and with humble hearts, we acknowledge those medicine ancestors that have shown the way before, that have offered pathways of deep connection with earth and spirit. And in particular this day, I wish to acknowledge Melodoma and his life's work and his medicine and his teachers before him, his father, his grandfather, his all those ones that came before him. We thank them for bringing us this medicine that they brought into this world and leaving it here in the ground so that we can find it. Leaving it here in the ground before they went on to the world of the ancestors once again. So we welcome those medicine ancestors to this summit, to this circle, with much gratitude, Ashe. And now facing the east, standing in that place in nature, we welcome the sunrise, the place of springtime and new beginnings and fresh new starts. The place where the emerging colors of spring begin to poke out of the ground and bud out of the trees. That place of new beginnings and fresh new starts where we learn to see for the first time everything where we drop the old stories of what has been and we welcome the new stories of inspiration and vision and curiosity and hope and wonder. We call upon that good medicine of the spring and welcome this new day, this sunrise, with much gratitude. Ashe. In quarter turn to the right, we now face south standing in that very special spot in nature that you see yourself standing in, turn towards the south. And we call upon the good medicine people of the south, the place of summertime, the place of action and beauty unshadowed by thought, the place of courage, integrity, and impeccability, the place of bringing our vision of the east into form, so that the people can see. We call on that place of the South, the good medicine people of the South, where our thoughts and our feelings and our words and our actions are exactly the same. And to the spirit of fire. With much gratitude to the good medicine people of the South, we welcome you to this circle to the summit, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Ashe. Quarter turn again to the right, we face west. Toward the setting sun, toward the autumn leaves, bright colored leaves overhead and on the ground, the cooler nights of autumn, the place of the harvest, the place of receiving and gifting in the place of initiation and change and transformation. We call upon the good medicine people of the West and the element of water and healing and reconciliation to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. We welcome you, Ashe. In quarter turn to the right again, we face north toward that sacred mountain, toward the spirit of winter, to that place of surrender, that place for the, by the winter's hearth fires where we share in community and in stories, that place where we learn to let go so completely that spring simply shows up because we let go enough and often for no other reason. 
and call to the story keepers and the elders of the North and the good medicine people of the North. And we invite you into the circle to awaken within each one of us that bone memory, that medicine where you live as well. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Ashe. Now looking skyward, we call upon Sky Nation. Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun, our star sisters and brothers and others. We thank you for shining down your lights upon us and reminding us too that we can shine as a bright beacon of light by the way we live our lives so that you can see us from out there. We thank you, Grandmother Moon, for helping us own those places that are sometimes held in shadow, those things we would rather not acknowledge or talk about or even see. And we thank you for bringing, teaching us how to bring these things held in shadow into the light over and over and over again, to bring them into full visibility and acknowledgement. Grandfather Son, we thank you for showing up every day, calling us forward toward the light, toward the warmth, toward the fire. We thank you for teaching us about how to fall down seven times and get up eight, always eight. With much gratitude, we acknowledge all our sky sisters and brothers and others and welcome you to the circle, to the summit, to awaken within each one of us those bits of stardust that exist in our own bodies. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Ashe. Now kneeling down toward the ground in this place in nature, place your hands on the soil. Feel the soil in your hands. Feel the earth beneath you. That place where soil and soul come together as one identity. That place where we are not separate from this great earth. So we call on Pachimama, the great below. We thank you for teaching us of belonging, connection, and place. For reminding us that we are not alone and that we are not separate. We thank you for reminding us of those connections that we have to all peoples across this planet, human and non-human peoples, and that there are no borders and divisions upon you that we did not place there. And we thank you for reminding us of home and of how to live in balance, and that scarcity is an illusion that comes about by living out of balance with you. So we thank you for these great teachings and great reminders. And we welcome you to this circle. And we help, ask that you help us remember to dream once again the dreaming of the earth, to weave together soil and soul so that our dreams can dream in a new earth a new relationship of belonging with each other and with this planet. With much gratitude, we acknowledge you and we welcome you. Ashe. And turning toward the center of the circle, maybe imagining there's a fire there burning in front of you. We look into the fire and we acknowledge our ancestors. To those bright and shiny ones that lived well and died well, and those that are well in spirit, we acknowledge you this day and we call upon you. We thank you for your lives, your laughter, and your teardrops. And we thank you for dreaming us into this place. So with much gratitude, we acknowledge your lives. And to those ones standing in front of us, seven generations and beyond, that are waiting to arrive here, that are watching to see how we live our lives so they will know what to do when they get here. We thank you for that accountability and that trust. May the way that we live our lives be deserving of it. With much gratitude, we acknowledge those ancestors. We welcome you, Ashe. And now to the spirits of this land, 
the lands that surround you, where you live right now. We acknowledge the First Nation peoples of those lands and these lands. And we thank those First Nations peoples for reminding us and keeping alive the dream of how, be, how to be in right relationship with this planet. And to the mountain spirits and the great bodies of water that surround us each in, this, in the place that we are in, we thank you. And to the swimmers and the crawlers, the four-leggeds and the two-leggeds and the winged ones, that live around you in the place that you live. We offer our gratitude. And we invite you to bring your voice into the circle and help us remember too how to be in right relationship with all peoples, human and non-human. With much gratitude. Ashe. feel like we have quite a full house when when we do that <laughs> yes i say thank you kater absolutely so, conversations about earth yes um, so what's coming to me in this moment is uh one of the teachings when i when I work with my apprentices about Earth that has been shared with me by many of my teachers is what I call the many different faces of Earth. And there's Earth as spirit, Gaia, Pachamama, one to be in relationship with to call on. And there's Earth as uh, medicine uh, to restore uh, a place of belonging, connection, um, connection with with the planet, connection with each other, um, and there's Earth is is a, a clearing energy in which we can work with to clear away and deposit and compost, if you will, um, those things that are no longer serving us. We can put them back in the ground and let them become something else. Um, in that face of earth, that is uh, um, who we are, identity, personal personal identity. One of the, uh, there are many, many different types of earth rituals. One of them is, uh, that I recall in this moment, is more of a complete submersion uh, in ritual when it's buried um, up to their neck. And uh, through prayer and connection and ceremony, uh, remain in that in that place um, as a as a remerging. I like to say I, I go into Earth to remember myself as Earth, um, and that all that Earth has to offer us in that way of connecting. And uh, of course, for those of us who can't do a complete submerger in Earth to bring a little soil into the house. Um, even just have a place uh, to, to create an earth shrine in your yard or in your apartment where you just bring some soil and make a mound of earth um, as a way of connecting with that soil. Um, speaking of Melodoma, I know in, in his traditions they have, uh, in the village, they have what's called the Tingan Sob, or actually a Timbalo Sob as well. Um, and Tingan is the name for earth in Dagara language and um, in Burkina Faso. And the Tingan Sob is the keeper of the earth shrine. Um, and so the keeper of the earth shrine, uh, their, their role in the village is that of similar to like village elder that tends the, the heartbeat of everyone in the community. Um, so this way that, that in their cosmology, Earth sits at the center of the wheel. Um, and so it's a place we, we take our, our, uh, our uh, places of uh, wishes for connection, or I guess our, our challenges with disconnection. Um, 
and one of the ways I like to to think about Earth is is that uh, there was a time in all of our lineages, if we went back far enough, uh, where um, like say like this uh, braided piece of sweet grass, where each one of these braids represented a part of our identity. We say that one of these braids represents our ancestral identity. One of these braids represents our individual identity. And one of these braids represents our connection and relationship to the land in which those two come together. Um, this day and age, we've been so separated from our ancestral lands and um, so often find uh, these, these ceremonies and rituals where we weave back together the sense of personal identity, ancestral identity, and relationship with earth to actually weave it back like, like sweet grass, weave it back into one identity. So that there was a time when one could not speak of who they were without acknowledging their ancestors and the land in which they were connected. Um, and so if, if, as Joseph Campbell says in one of his quotes, if we think of ourselves as coming out of the earth instead of being deposited down here, <laughs> There's much more of a sense of uh, identity and belonging and therefore uh, relationship to care for something. Um, that if we don't have a relationship with it, the, the concept of reciprocity uh, gets exchanged for the concept of uh, uh, more of a commodity where reciprocity turns into commodity, and that becomes the new relationship that modernity has with earth, with nature. Um, and so how do, we rest, how do we move back from this realm of commodity toward uh, reciprocity uh, with relationship with earth? Uh, because in these times where, the, where we, Joanna Macy would speak of the great turning, um, we're... Uh, recognizably at a very delicate threshold of um, no return. And um, you know, I think it's important not to get overwhelmed, um, but it is important to see, um, to, to look and, and feel what we see um, and let that in. Otherwise, there would be no... Uh, no even awareness of taking any different action. Um, so I am aware that there's, there's a certain cross, a cross hold we could cross in which um, uh, I, don't, I, I believe the earth will figure out a way of sustaining itself. I don't know that humans will be part of the new story. <laughs> so um, in terms of uh, ge geological and earth time, uh, on a 24-hour clock, I think we've only been here a few seconds as regard to everything else. So just to say, species come and go, and uh, but I do think it's you know in in listening and learning from our ancestral ancestors, our old ancient ancestors who had deep relationship with the ground that they lived on, we can remember something about how to be in right relationship uh, to Earth. And, um, and I know for me, sometimes it can get so big. I was like, what could I possibly do to make a change? It's like, that seems like, you know, we're walking down this, this dead end road and no one wants to acknowledge it. Um, and the task seems so immense. Um, and, and I think for many, and sometimes other two can get lost in the immensity of, of it. it feels like, well, what, what really can be done? Um, and I think if we pull that back to um, what is it that I am here to offer um, and align myself with that um, as it's connected to these other uh, questions and, and challenges we're facing on the planet. Um, you know, over the past few years we've at least globally and politically we've we've seen this kind of gravitational pull towards nationalism and uh, 
autocratic rulership. And yet from my from more of my uh, humble ceremonial perspective, it, it seems like as people uh, operate from this place of scarcity, they begin to grasp hold of their resources and want to protect them. And we move from a global family uh, to the the us against them, and um, which then geopolitically looks like very different scenarios, where people start to grasp for the last resources and close their borders and limit, um, as if somehow it it creates it creates the illusion of a of a a short term remedy, actually the illusion of a remedy, but very short term maybe. Um, and in reality, we have, you know, as I say, there's no borders of division. We have to learn how to live on this planet together. Um, and there's so much stuff going on in the world that distracts us from from the, the fact that we're walking down a dead end road. Um, so coming back, what what can I personally do uh, to make a difference? Is to takes me back to to my love for rites of passage and and. Um, prayer fasting and vision questing, which is how do I align myself uh, with the very medicine and gift that I came into this world to offer, because that is what I'm here to offer in this time. Um, and I might not be aware of how that will impact the greater story, but that is what I have to bring. Um, and so to me, that's a starting place. That's a question. Um, I love that there was a quote by, uh, I think it was Joanna Macy, maybe Carl Jung first started and she took the quote, but it's, it's um, this idea that um, when we live on the edge of uncertainty, or, or uncertainty is the, um, often the breeding ground for the greatest creativity uh, when we come to the edge. Um, and so we're there. It stimulates uh, innovative creativity when they're, you know, when you're right on that edge. And she also says that, you know, there's one great question that runs like a thread through everyone's life. And if you can find it, uh, it's rare indeed. Um, and the questions are meant to be lived into, not simply to be answered and put on a shelf. Um, but to find what is that one great question that runs in, like a thread through my life? Because it's in that question is also the, the antidote of what you bring to this world. Um, Mel Doma used to say that the trouble you see is simply you're seeing it because it's your job description. Um, think of your eyes as the, the uh, now, I, not, not, I wouldn't say video recorder anymore, I'd say digital recorder. Of the from the realm of the ancestors, and it's because you see it that you carry some degree of antidote for it, um, and so that's embedded in that idea that, um, you know, like the 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 questing ceremonies when we go out into nature, when we go up on the mountain. Um, I always say it's much better to return with a really good question than with an answer, uh, because it's the questions that we live into. It's the questions that we that shape a life. Um, it's the questions we follow. Um, and some native people say, you know, the may the question you carry be one that cannot be uh, reconciled in your lifetime, but when you pass on that you live forward for the next generations in front of you. Um, for the for the for the one who plants a tree. Hmm. that they will never see, that they will never sit beneath its shade, but their great-grandchildren will. That, that kind of thinking, that's what's called for now. Not, not how will this, uh, we, as Mel Donna said, we've got, we got to cure the mind of this desire for immediate gratification. Um, and uh, because it, there's no, that's not sustainable. Um, and so those questions, those visions, those ones who, whatever their, their uh, uh, tree is in their life that they're planting, that they won't see grow, or they won't be able to sit beneath its shade, 
but they're going to tend to it. Um, whatever that is, these are the places we look for. Um, you know, when it comes to other actions one can take and be deep and in right relationship with Earth, um, you know, Joanna Macy's work and, and many can give a long list of um, action items, very simple to take. Um, you know, that uh, I think if everyone on the planet didn't eat red meat for a day, a week, that would be significant. Um, so that the grazing of these animals on the planet is one of those primary uh, detriments to our, to our ozone layer. Um, it's interesting. Now, even yesterday, I heard a, I heard a report that talked about uh, how um, astronomers are noticing the impact that they are having with their work when they're just studying the creation of all their telescopes and, and uh, the science and beginning to look at you know how is this too impacting um, life on Earth. And so it's, you know, beginning to look at what things, how do I live my life and what are the, what may seem like very small adjustments that I could personally make. Those are the, what I would call the action steps. Um, and then the, the, the bigger one that I like is, uh, that, that speaks to me in life is more of that, am I aligned with the medicine that I came into this world to deliver? Um, and how, and if not, how do I get there? What what are the what are ways that will help me navigate back to that alignment? Because that is what we all have to offer. Um, and again, it may not seem very large in a person's life, but I think it's the the most important thing that one came here to do. Um, from an indigenous perspective, or um, and I've seen this across several different. Uh, indigenous communities and tribes, this concept uh, that we come into this world from the realm of the ancestors bringing a gift of healing for, the, for this world. And so simply coming here means we have something, something to offer. Um, and uh, the rites of passages and initiations and things like this are, are designed to activate the memory of that medicine not to fill us up with uh, the values of modernity that then tell you what is best for you to do to serve some immediate gratification need. Um, but the idea that this thing is already within you, this identity of belonging and action is something you come in with. It's not something that uh, is put there once you're here. Um, it's something you remember. Maybe through your studies in school you you, you go through this memory experience whether you remember more and more. It's like, oh, this is the track for me, or this is the track. Um, but it's, it's more of a remembering process than a discovery process. Um, and so that's a, another important feature of uh, relationship with Earth, is taking time, um, again, just to put our hands on the soil. Um, and uh, and connect. It can be very, it can be simply it can be as simple as that. Um, and then uh, the, the way in which we belong to our lives. Earth, earth medicine to me is a lot about belonging and connection. And um, so to examine how is it that I belong within my own skin, within my community, within my family. Do I, do I live from this place of belonging um, that uh, inspires and directs my life? Um, and so these questions to begin to, to, to sit with and think about. Um, so there's a few things that come up at the, at the beginning of our conversation just that, that want to be said. Um, Anything, as I speak, anything stirring for you about all any of that, Maya? All of it is stirring for me, <laughs> Cater. Well, what I wanted to specifically ask for our audience, and you did mention, you did mention how, but oh, but I still wanted you to maybe emphasize a little more. Um, a lot of uh, 
people come to me kind of like when we're talking about personal medicine and they bring, they want to know what it is, you know, and you've mentioned, of course, that it's not a fast process, that it is a question, that it is a process of remembering. So I was wondering if you can like speak into that just for a little, just a little bit more, you know. Okay. Um or it, it uh, stimulates a story based on that concept. As I was saying, this idea of coming in, and it's a story I've seen with a couple of people I've worked with before from uh, indigenous communities where they went to live with an elder shortly after being born for the purpose of acquiring a different name. And uh, inscribed in the name is often elements or animals or features in the landscape that the elder sees in them and then they give them this other name um, what we may popularly call these days like medicine names or but these things are meant as um, roadmaps not really badges of identity or um, an example of of a lot of traits that you see in a person that often it gets confused as that but they're meant as no this is meant as what a roadmap for where you're headed as I tell some people when they speak to me of medicine names I said if you get a good medicine name you will be very uncomfortable with it because you haven't lived into it and that's what your life is for is to live into this name so may it be you know a name that carries you a long way so first there's that concept of uh, really understanding in the ancient ways how they acknowledge this um, this gift this medicine that we come in with um, it is also aligned uh, ancestrally with uh, certain ancestors that carried the same medicine that you come in with and so this idea of understanding relationship with your ancestors becomes an important feature. These may be ancestors you don't know or remember, um, but it, it's linked um, through your lineage. Um, it's not simply just showing up here for the first time within you. So it also builds in the concept of the idea that many call the hollow bone. These things don't come from us, they come through us. And it's by humble relationship with the sources of uh, connection from which it does come that enables us to, to bring it forward. So that humble uh, connection with ancestors or earth or nature to realize uh, this, isn't a, this isn't about me, this is simply about what I'm here to offer. Um, and so I find a lot of people, when they confuse those things, it can get really treacherous when it starts to feel like them. That, that uh, uh, what Carlos Castaneda would call the only adversary to the spiritual warrior is self-importance. <laughs> and you got to watch out for it because it's got a lot of different faces. <laughs> so uh, humble gratitude and relationship to sources of uh, support in the natural world and the ancestral world and, um, and and whatever our sacred traditions of honoring that we have relationship with that's the first uh, aspect of, of being able to channel being able to to bring this forward um, otherwise it gets into uh, modernity's realm of scarcity competition and better and less than thinking mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole trap um, where one begins to try and figure all this out through a, from a paradigm of thinking where it can't even live. On a more practical note, um, this remembering is not a one-time thing. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 62 now, and when I look at my childhood and what I gravitated towards in terms of play and interest, I can see back there the very early uh, ingredients, if you will, to where I am now. Um, so often looking backwards, I can see, oh, there was this, there was this map unfolding. I was interested in this, or I did this, or I enjoyed this. And it's like now not much has changed when I look at it from that perspective. It's just doing it different. So sometimes these things exist very early on in a, in a uh, 
unformed way in our childhood. Um, but how do you activate it? Um, so there, there's where I would lean into more of the rites of passage, the, the vision quests, the prayer fasts, the underworld journeys, the um, hill walking, all the different names that that, that particular process had around the planet throughout history. But this idea of going into nature and eliminating distractions and being still and uh, most time it involves some fasting um, and exposure to the natural world um, but not simply uh, by oneself that's a, a modern day interpretation where people think oh I could do that I could just go out in the woods and, and spend do a vision quest by, you know I can stay out there three or four days and nights and said so, no that's that's that can be powerful, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's connected to a village, something that's connected to elders that are guiding you, uh, something that uh, where you have support from people to help you uh, see the things you don't know you don't know. Um, so uh, whether it's a day long experience, but something that where the mind quiets. Um, so if we look at most all of the major spiritual traditions on the planet, we can trace the origins of those traditions to someone who did this, who right. broke away and went into the wilderness um, and fasted and prayed and quested and came back. And when they came back is when they started their their teachings, their medicine work, their offering their gift in a different way. Um, we can see it in, uh, let's say, many of uh, Buddhism and Christianity and Judaism, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go back to a, an identifiable uh, person who did a quest and then returned and then began this process. So it's, um, it's a way of activating and awakening uh, those memories. Um, but sometimes what stands between us and that, that uh, activation are what I call gatekeepers. And those gatekeepers can be ancestral. They can, they can be ancestral trauma. They can be you know, our own life trauma experiences. They can be just the, the, the myths of modernity. Um, like I say in, in, uh, in one of my poems, I say if you... If you uh, if you're not connected to the to the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living a life that's not entirely your own. Um, and so that our modern society has its myths. And, uh, and as Joseph Campbell says, the, if you want to know what the myths of the society you live in, look around and see what the tallest buildings are. And that will tell you what the myths that society wants to give you. And say, here's the myths, here's what we value, Here's what you should do with your life, um, and it's so uh, it's so backwards from from the other way, which which is um, no, you come in with that, and that the the job of the teacher is not to fill you up with their mythology, but to draw out of you, mm. it's in you to pull it out, to get it out, mm. um, and that takes a village. Um, okay. So. Uh, I wanted to say like quickly that like that 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 was when I went on a vision quest. It was my idea. Like I always loved being alone in nature, and it was romantic to me. And I was looking forward to those four days and four nights of fasting. But my whole lesson of doing the vision quest was really uh, just understanding the importance of the village and being supported by the village. And uh, so th this is really what I carried away from the whole from the vision quest right. from the 10 or 11 days that um, the rites of passage council and that, that uh, you, you held that, that, that whole ceremony. So yeah, thank you. Right, yeah. So yeah, the, 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 the village and the ceremonies and rituals of preparation uh, to assist in, in dealing with these gatekeepers and connecting one to a more core sense of their gift 
and then going out on the mountain with that. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having Im images of your particular work, which I can't speak of because it's not my story, but it, it definitely this deep connection to earth and beginning to listen and uh, listen to the dreaming of the earth and channel, uh, channel that information. It's probably the, the, the reason we're sitting here talking today. Um, on the summit is, is uh, you know, it wasn't new information, but it got activated in a different way, in a stronger way. Um, yeah, I think I, like basically everything you said is so, so true and how it played out in my life. Well, I'll just say that I'm, I'm 43 right now. And as, as a child, I'm not sure how old, let's say 10 years old, I was uh, out in the Black Sea and I just love being there. This is my place of connection that I remember the most from childhood. And my dad told me a simple story that the fish now is so small and when he was younger, it was just so much bigger and things are degrading environmentally. And in my naivety, I was thinking, well, this is it. We must, we must restore it. We must bring it back. So this, this is what I wanted to do. And part of it was going to United States and getting an environmental science degree. And then later going out into the land and doing environmental surveys. And I was thinking, I'll find every listed species there is. I will find them. But then afterwards, I realized that this, this isn't, wasn't quite it. Just, just like you described, you know, what, how, how our society is built and what, uh, how we look for things. I thought, well, what's missing is this piece of like really sacred ecology, you know, that our personal relationship with the, the, the land and nature and earth, and this is what needs to be brought back. So this is what I started after I started like, well, we need a summit, we need this, that. So there's all these different components. And of course, you know, I don't have an answer. I didn't fix the problem. Did I fix the Black Sea? No, but I'm doing something. I'm, I'm, <laughs> right, you've got some good questions there, some questions to, to grow into, the questions that created the summit. And this, uh, but I, I love your story when you, when you spoke, there was a moment in childhood where you thought, well, we have to do something. And now, that would not be an automatic thought of every child that would hear their father say that. Um, there may be something else that, that's stirring, some other gift, some other thing that would be happening um, but that, that speaks to, uh, even the idea that, you know, even with our listeners today, if you walk back down through your own history into your childhood, you may, uh, uncover some moments of, of recognition of, of, of this kind of bone memory that you come in with, um, bone memory being that which is older than you biographically. Uh, biologically, bone memory that's that's in there, that's ancient, and and it shows up in it like in that comment to you, uh, that awareness, and that sense, oh, I have to do something. Um, I think of my own life. At, at a certain age, um, we moved, we uh, I grew up next to the um, to the sea, to the water. Uh, we had a lot of marsh behind our our house. Where the yard descended down to, to marsh grass and tidal creeks and um, and so I had that kind of relationship with this threshold between land and water and and there was a certain kind of mystery and danger to this other area that drew my attention uh, and then when I got to be a teenager I, I began to we moved to a different place and I would spend a lot of times in in the forest mm -hmm. um, and having grown up um, in the particular um, religion of Catholicism, um, had a, you know had those imprints of ritual and ceremony and kind of what that was like. And, and I'm very fortunate and and uh, that I did not have a bad experience with uh, with my Catholic school upbringing, um, and it left some fairly positive imprints. But as I got to be a teenager, I recognized in my story, it's like, oh, I would spend lots of time out in nature, um, connecting with nature and talking to the spirits. I didn't know that back then. I was just having conversations. And now it's like my life's work is essentially taking people out into nature to talk to the spirits and find out what they're like, oh, I was like 
doing that at 12. <laughs> um, I didn't know that that's what I was doing, but it, I, I haven't changed that much apparently. <laughs> um, so it is, it is nice when we find these threads, it's like they're reminders for some of us like, oh, maybe I'm not off track. And then for other people, it's like, you know, I took on this life because someone else wanted me to take it on. And I'm, and I'm beginning to feel like this is not where I belong. And I've had people, you know, uh, I've done work with people that came to that recognition. Uh, and sometimes, sadly, after many years of school and professional work, and they think, you know, this was never for me. Well, I always wanted to be this or do that. Um, but it's back there. Those, those, those uh, threads or breadcrumbs of identity and medicine and gift uh, uh, live in those childhood stories. Um, the powerful experience of, of, uh, of the prayer fast or, or uh, vision quest is this idea of uh, going into nature after much preparation um, and spending enough time there uh, in solitude uh, so that our thoughts lay quiet. Maybe hard to imagine for some people but our thinking mind um, becomes a, is such a distraction and it just runs constantly. But in my experience with the, with the quest is that when you're out there long enough, eventually the thinking mind uh, stops. Um, sometimes after it remembers some things that drive it, sometimes old memories of pain and, and difficulty rise up and we have to feel it. Uh, because it's the unacknowledged uh, traumas and unacknowledged feeling memories that, that drive this kind of constant need for immediate gratification and constant thinking. Um, and once with that energy moves through us, all of a sudden our mind is quiet. Um, and what happens then is we, we start to notice. Uh, we start to be in relationship with, you know, the squirrel that seems to travel the same branch every morning about the same time, or the or the the bird that flies in just over my questing site about the same time in the morning and chose one morning to land on my head uh, because I was still enough. Um, these, uh, it, it's like uh, when we eliminate the the internal angst and, and challenges, not eliminate, but when we work to heal it, um, we become recognizable to the natural world as one of their own. Somebody asked me one time, why is it in ritual out in nature that animals and, and, uh, and birds and, and even elements seem to engage with us in this very mysterious way that's that's unexplainable the the moment of this or the arrival of this or the encounter with this so why does that happen and as best as i can tell is that it is in in ritual or in ceremony that we become as humans authentically recognizable to the natural world and so they feel better coming in close um, where most of the time they just you know see people walk in the woods and say well i never see anything i don't hear anything because uh, if you're paying attention when you go into the woods, you might hear this one bird initially, and it's kind of the alarm bird that signals all the other birds to get out of the way. <laughs> um, so we don't see anything or hear anything. But if you stop and remain still for long enough, it starts coming back. And, and also the, the, the emotional energy that if, as we release that, then it really comes out. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of of encounters with animals after an emotional release uh, where a person was dealing with something and they were completely open and vulnerable and all of a sudden this eagle or in, in one story I knew of um, where this person went swimming with with dolphins and it was uh, and they swam out to be with the dolphins and all the dolphins scattered and, and it was one of these group things and they saw swam over there to be with the dolphins and they all went away 
and they kept doing this and all of a sudden what got triggered was their abandonment uh, of childhood and then they began to to weep and cry and they just they just were floating in the water crying and the dolphins came up underneath them and lifted them yeah there there is um it, this is what i have noticed in in terms of our relation it's all about relationship um and science in its uh, many amazing faceted offerings that it offers us is not about relationship <laughs> um, I've heard many people that, that even have deep relationship with plants and the, the plant medicines and then they you know become a botanist and it's all about science and it's like not personal relationship and uh, and if they keep that keep that other part alive then they come back it's kind of like you and your studies like then you come back it's like now let's enter into relationship let me let me sit let me listen let me understand um, and, and bring those things together um, yeah I so think... yeah that's if anything I can find find one thing in nature uh, that you can deepen relationship with animals birds plants and it will change you um, and a house uh, uh, before I moved into my current house um, I lived in more of a residential neighborhood um, and I would drink my coffee on the back porch in the morning and there was a, a woodpecker that lived right there and so every morning we would spend time together and it's like I knew where they lived and they knew where I lived and we had this connection and we would chat and and, uh, and one morning it wasn't the wasn't the woodpecker but one spring morning I opened the door and the bird flew into the house and like flew around the room three times and then went back out um, so I think that you know it's um, in things we don't have relationship with we don't think to preserve or protect and, and this is key uh, it because I say it, it moves from uh, a relationship of reciprocity to a relationship of commodity um, and, and that's dangerous both for ourselves and, and the other. Um, reciprocity, say, well, how do you enter a relationship of reciprocity with the birds of the earth uh, or the animals? I said, well, take some bird seed out. Uh, put a, put a, 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 a bluebird house in the meadow. Put a, put, this, put a hummingbird feeder outside your kitchen window. Um, you know, if you, if you live in the land of bears like I do, you know, um, they love bird seed too, but put it out on a stump. Otherwise, it'll destroy your bird feeder. Um, you, it's like a reciprocity is to make a, 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 an offering, an acknowledgement, a gratitude. I uh, say to open those channels of connection requires humility and gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, to go to the earth and, and pour some water in a, in a dry place for a plant. It's just... Um, it's about relationship um, and uh, you, you will be in doing this you may like I've often been often surprised uh, beyond anything that can be described as a coincidence as to what might happen uh, between you and the natural world when they start coming in close and I've seen mountain lions and blue herons uh, come in when 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 stuff's happening that where we where I say we we become authentically familiar to the natural world so they naturally want to come in they're curious and engage or offer mm -hmm. or, or maybe they have something to ask of us um, and I would just I mean, kind of a uh, a humorous thing is that we often develop this relationship of um, going to nature from a place of um, uh, what we'd call egocentric rather than ecocentric. Um, so we look for signs from animals. What does this animal have to tell me? What is this? What is the sign here of this tree telling me that has a message for me? It's like, wait a minute. It may be needing to ask you for something. Don't think it's always there just to give you something. Uh, Maybe it needs to alert you that our, you know, the stream by your house is, is 
becoming toxic? Will you do something about it? Um, so even shifting from a from a from an egocentric relationship place to an ecocentric or even a soul centric, as Bill Plotkin likes to name these three divisions, um, can help us shift this this paradigm of how we relate um, to the earth, to the natural world. Um, so, so so much so much to say there. Yeah. I'll pause again and see if you say something that. Uh, takes me down another rabbit hole. <laughs> no, it's it's wonderful. All of it is, is is so true and so right. And yeah, the the word relationship and and uh, I just I just had this one um, thing brought to mind. Is um, who was talking about it? Usually, when we try to at first when we try to connect to the natural world, like you said, you have a message for me, 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 or this right, thing. right. And but how often do we go out? Even like I'm, I'm talking about, let's say just myself. You know, I had to teach myself. You go out and you have to say like, but whoa, just let's say like have, talking to the elements or or like just tell me about your life. You know, how has it been for you? You know, talking about water, and it doesn't mean that like I'm getting answers or somebody's like I'm listening to the wind. I'm not there yet. Well, well, sometimes that happens, but it's not like always like oh, I hear the whole story of water. It's just putting out the question there that I'm, I'm curious, I'm wondering, how is it? How has it been for water? Where did it come from? Where, what, what does she do, you know? And it's like that, like you said, with the tree, with anything, just mm -hmm. ask about them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, and, and for those that might feel a little bit like um, challenged by the personification of relationship with the natural world, um, or what we're talking more is a animistic way of relating uh, to the natural world that, that everything is alive, everything has consciousness, um, not in the way of that we think of human consciousness, but everything has a consciousness that it interacts with. Um, and uh, you know, for people that like one simple example, like you were indicating, Maya, this. Uh, like if you if you have a tree that's important to you, and you go and you take something, take an offering to the tree, some water, some something, um, and you sit with the tree, and um, you connect with the tree, and I would say after you've done that, now sit back and let the tree connect with you. So you go into a receptive state, not in a doing. Um, but you make a connection, maybe a touch, maybe an offering, and then relax back and allow the tree now to to offer something back energetically. Um, and even if we're bridging animis, animism with physics, everything is made of energy, right? So everything has a field of energy that, that surrounds it. And when we enter into another's field of energy, uh, we have a relationship to connect with all that's in that field. Um, and so in some ways, the, uh, there, there's this uh, place where I would say uh, um, physics and animism can kind of cross over because it's all, all energy and consciousness. Um, but again, finding something to have relationship with um, and maintaining it. Um, you know, if we have good friends, um, we have good friends because we have relationship with them, um, and we talk with them, and we're not just there when everything's well, or we may even get in a fight with them, but that's okay too because they're our friends and we'll work it out and we're still going to be there, um, and and so there's this uh, enduring quality of connection um, that sustains um, through difficult times. Um, and so again, finding something simple that, uh, and present that you can be present with in nature um, and with earth and, and uh, make connection to. Um, can, you know, over time it can, it can change everything. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Kater. It's You're welcome, you're welcome. Beautiful, I just wanted to say that um, 
since we're kind of uh, getting close in time, did you want to say anything about your free gift? Oh, the free gift. Um, yes. So uh, actually, there's kind of two free gifts. One, if you click on the first link, it'll get you to a place where you can um, sign up to receive a free audio drumming story um, of me performing a story called Singing Stone. It's a story of the initiatory passage. Um, and also, you, once you do that, your name will be entered into a drawing um, for a free divination. Uh, if you, that was uh, what was Mayo was talking about in the beginning. Calorie divination reading is, is also something I offer. So um, after this summit, I'll probably wait a week after the summit and before I gather up all the names of people that, uh, and then we'll do a, a random drawing um, for, which is what random looks like for me in that case is I, uh, I count all the names and to see how many we have. And then I call my um, admin assistant and I say, okay, pick a number between this and that. And she'll give me a number and then I'll go down the list and say, okay, there's the person. So that's kind of how the random drawing works. Um, then I contact that person and let them know they have a free divination and we schedule it. Um, and you can also read about the divination, coward shell divination process there in the, in the gift description. Yes. Yeah, it'll be provided like right below this video and also on Cater's page. So it, it's all here for you to claim. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cater, for being a part of protecting guys oasis and for your wonderful work in the world it has definitely benefited and changed my life so thank you thank you maya it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you uh, and to, to all those that are listening in thank you for joining us and hope to see you maybe one day uh, down the road sitting around one of these sacred fires in our hands in the soil <laughs> Nashe. Nashe.